Good afternoon. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's panel on reform, policy and advocacy. I have a very distinguished panel here with me to reflect on the very rich discussion of the last two days and to look into ways of seizing on all the information that has been exchanged here to further freedom of information. My name is Marianne Schulze. I am a human rights consultant based here in Vienna and I'm representing the board of the Austrian League for Human Rights as a co-sponsor uh, to this very important conference. I have with me here today Jacqueline Harrison, Spider Alex, Costa Efimeros, Arne Hinz, Andreas Krisch, and George Catrogalos. Did I get this just about right? Thank you. And um, we obviously have a lot to learn um, from their input, and we will certainly start with initial <coughs> statements by them. In the interest of the debate, and particularly in the interest of reflecting on the richness of what has been discussed over the last two days, I have asked them to try and limit their statements to an absolute maximum of 10 minutes. Um, if we can try and stick to that, that will be very welcome. Anything shorter will be also welcome. And um, I will equally implore on you as an audience to try and be swift and quick uh, in the comments uh, you, and questions you pose so that we can have a critical mass of people contributing to this very important discussion around advocacy and policy in going ahead. With, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Jacqueline Harrison. She's a professor at the Centre for Freedom of the Media in the United Kingdom, uh, works on communication as a chair of the Center for Freedom of the Media at the University of Sheffield. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Can you hear me all right? So Thank you. Okay, I've been asked to talk about um, the Center for Freedom of the Media and some of the work that we're doing at Sheffield. Uh, so I thought I'd start off by talking about it and giving you a little bit of background and then to lead on to um, show you some of the impact and some of the activities that we've been undertaking. So the Centre for Freedom of the Media then is an interdisciplinary research centre based at the Department of Journalism Studies at the University of, of Sheffield. Um, my own academic focus um, is on the civil power of the news. That's news in its civil role as an institution of civil society, which is kind of an unusual place to place it in some respects but it's where it succeeds in terms of its civil role, its negotiation with the non-civil spheres, by that I mean state and markets, etc., and where it actually exercises profoundly anti-civil sentiments, uh, working against what I would call civil society interests, for a variety of reasons, which we've, we've talked about over the last two days, which emanate from a competition, basically, between competing interests that seek to use the power of the media to, save the, to serve their own ends or to silence dissenting voices, something that we're all too familiar with. The founding principle then of CFOM is to illuminate where news media freedom is undermined or abused and to examine news media standards of independence and truthfulness. So we work with a range of external stakeholders to evaluate the role of free and independent media in building and maintaining political and civil freedoms worldwide. So our current research aims to provide an independent platform to assess the effectiveness of existing legal, political and institutional safeguards against violence directed at journalists to present the case for more effective international mechanisms to counter such crimes of violence and to end impunity. So we evaluate the state of media freedom in Europe, analyze news media freedom regulation and civil power, and assess news media standards and self-censorship. I think it's important to stress that what we recognize is that there's a sliding scale or a, or a spectrum of freedoms, of course. We go from chilling of journalism to the killing of journalists, and obviously there's a lot of things that go on in between. Um, 
An attack on journalism, we believe, is an attack on freedom of expression. Attacks against journalists and impunity lead to self-censorship, loss of faith in the judicial system, and undermine the rule of law. Um, if you see um, the rule of law as also a civil society institution when it works for us as citizens, then you can see that media that is corrupted and law that's corrupted is going to obviously um, not allow for vibrant public discourse in a civil setting. Intimidation and controls on news media make fraudulent <coughs> elections more likely and are linked to increases in corruption, crime and human rights violations. It's an unsafe environment in many countries and requires constant review and reform of legislation, judicial independence, public engagement, and concerted actions by stakeholders. Um, in that vein, um, CFOM is one of UNESCO's partner organizations doing something that we hope is concrete, um, working with them on a UN plan of action on the safety of journalists and the issues of impunity. The focus of that action plan is to provide an overarching framework for the UN system to work together with relevant stakeholders to create a safe environment for journalists, media work and uh, media producers um, and also social media workers as well. Also to combat impunity for crimes against them. So this role then is, um, we, we undertake um, different aspects really um, in terms of how we might interact and engage with different stakeholders. So at one level we are engaging with professionals and policy makers to stimulate debate. Um, those people that we think could, should or do play a, an important role in promoting journalism safety and working to combat impunity. So we have, we've held a series of problem solving conferences, um, we've been in partnership with City University and um, we've got an initiative called the um, Impunity Initiative which ran from two, in 2011-12. This work has fed into um, what UNESCO has been doing. Um, UNESCO designated that conference as a working conference in preparation for the action plan. So we feel as though we've had um, input into that. Um, at the moment, what, another strand of our work is to encourage media houses to engage with the action plan as well. And so we again host a, uh, hosted a symposium in October 2012 and brought together a number of different uh, frontline journalists, journalists association, news media editors and so on from 15 countries uh, which resulted in a London statement which we then presented to UNESCO um, for um, at, at the um, interagency meeting in 2012. And then finally, um, well not finally for us, but finally in terms of all I've got time to talk about I think, is another strand is um, we're now engaged in actually implementing some, some we have some action lines which we are um, implementing in line with the action plan. And one of those particular aspects is what we're doing at the University of Sheffield in our department um, as CFOM. And that is because we believe that there's also a level of responsibility that should come down to uh, journalism educators, we are a department of journalism studies, that we are now looking at ways in which the stakeholders themselves could be trainee journalists, our future editors, our future producers, um, in order to have a look really at to what extent we as educators can bring some of these ideas and awareness raising and so on into the curriculum. And obviously with an international student body as well as a home-based student body, what we are trying to do is to understand how home students may well learn from international students in terms of perceptions about what's happening in the world of journalism and to understand how media freedoms can easily be lost, very hard to win, but all too easily lost. And we would like our home students to really understand that, um, working as they do, um, largely in what is classed as a, a free media system and also for our international students to be able to understand as well that there are people concerned about what's going on and that we would integrate it into our um, curriculum. So we have a variety of, um, well actually empirical elements to this. We've interviewed editors in the UK uh, to find out what they would like us to or what they think we should introduce. We are, we're um, holding a survey at the moment um, with about a thousand journalism educators. We're going to survey our own students to see what they think um, we should include. So I, what I wanted to do in this presentation, just very briefly, um, was to try to um, show you how we are doing the things that are concrete, but also that we are having some impact, I think, in terms of what we're doing. And that 
um, this is a contribution. Obviously, in terms of research, there's much, much more we would like to do at the University of Sheffield. We're always looking for willing partners and collaborators, um, but there's many, many aspects of research that we could undertake, um, one of which is really what the public's view is of all this um, surveillance, but also in terms of their perceptions of journalism um, and the freedoms that journalism holds and then easily loses. And the public view is actually quite often ignored in the research. It tends to be about other things. So we would like, I think, to push on with um, certain aspects and, and achieve many, many strands that cover this spectrum. Thank you very much. Thank you very much also for keeping with the time. Uh, but in more importantly, the content and the fact that you already flagged up four opportunities, at, at the very minimum, in how um, human rights can be upheld and how freedom of the press can be strengthened. Uh, interesting started to say that um, a department takes on a particular role within uh, an unusual department to uh, strengthen journalism and the freedom of the press, but also how you interlink with the rule of law. And, um, Definitely the plan for increased safety for journalists under the guidance of the United Nations seems like a wonderful way to um, create awareness, which I think is something that is going to resonate throughout um, many of the comments that awareness raising about the importance of freedom of information and how to secure it um, is an urgent need. Okay, let, let's pragmatically pass on the floor. Uh, then to um, Costas Ephemeros, if I may, who's a um, publisher of the Press Project in Greece uh, and um, worked originally as a graphic designer and programmer on several publications and um, among others was involved in road safety issues for which he was awarded the European Road Safety Charter and um, is here on the reformation of the press through its economic model. The floor is yours. Uh, hello? Okay. Um, I, I have prepared my speech, but before we have the um, uh, time limit, uh, I will uh, use my language. So uh, I would kindly kind of request you to use the, your earphones. I'll begin with a story that on the 11th of June, of 2013, the government decided to close the radio telescope of the ethnic radiotelescope at the ERT in a night. Μόλις ανακοινώθηκε ότι θα κλείσει η ΕΡΤ, έγινε ένα, μια άμεσα μια συνέλευση των εργαζομένων, οι οποίοι αποφάσισαν ότι θα συνεχίσουν να μεταδίδουν το πρόγραμμα και στο ραδιόφωνο και στην τηλεόραση. Οκ, okay. okay, I will wait. Ναι, ναι. I have surprised them all. Το, το βράδυ τη 11η Ιουνίου, όπω έλεγα, του 2013, η κυβέρνηση αποφάσισε να κλείσει τον εθνικό μα ραδιοτηλεοπτικό φορέα την ΕΡΤ. Εκείνο το βράδυ μαζεύτηκαν όλοι οι εργαζόμενοι και σε μια έντονα συγκινησιακή συνέλευση που κάνανε, 
Ε, αποφασίσανε να συνεχίσουν τη μετάδοση ε, από το ραδιομέγαρο, από το κτίριο, το headquarters στην Αθήνα. Ε, εκείνο το βράδυ ένα συγκεκριμένο ε, γνωστό κιόλα πήρε ένα, μια κόλλα χαρτί και συμπλήρωσε σε αυτή την κόλλα ε, όλε τι βάρδιε που είναι απαραίτητε για να λειτουργεί το ραδιόφωνο και η τηλεόραση. Και το κόλλησε έξω από την πόρτα του, της αίθουσα σύνταξη. Επί 5,5 μήνε αυτό το χαρτί συμπληρωνόταν ω διαμαγεία χωρί καμία ιεραρχία. Επί 5,5 μήνε ο καθένα περνώντα από το κτίριο το πρωί πήγαινε και συμπλήρωνε τι βάρδιε που μπορούσε να, ε, να εκτελέσει. Και μάλιστα το συγκινητικό ήταν ότι έβλεπε δημοσιογράφου και τεχνικού να ε, συμπληρώνουν σε βάρδιε όταν δεν υπήρχε θέση στην καθαριότητα ή στη φύλαξη του κτιρίου. Αυτό δείχνει το ένα κομμάτι του πώ μπορεί να κάνει δημοσιογραφία. Η ίδια αυτή η ομάδα. Τόσου μήνε μετά έχει δυσκολευτεί να βρει ποιο θα είναι το μοντέλο που θα μπορέσει να πέραν του να διεκδικεί να, να, κάνει, να περιμένει κάτι να αλλάξει από την κυβέρνηση και για να ανακληθεί αυτή η απόφαση. Δεν έχει καταφέρει να βρει ένα μοντέλο το οποίο θα μπορούσε να την κρατήσει ζωντανή και να συνεχίσει. Και αυτό γιατί στην Ελλάδα, ε, και δεν θα σα κουράσω πολύ γι' αυτό, θα σα πω μόνο δύο-τρία παραδείγματα γιατί ήδη έχουν μιλήσει και οι συνάδελφοι από το Ανφόλο και ο κ. Κατρούγκαλο. Στην Ελλάδα η κατάσταση είναι σε τέτοια κατάσταση που πρέπει να αποφασίσουμε να διαλέξουμε μεταξύ ανεξάρτητης δημοσιογραφίας ή επιβίωσης. Δεν είναι εύκολο να, να, ζήσουν, να, να βρούμε ένα μοντέλο το οποίο να λειτουργεί και να είναι μια βιώσιμη κατάσταση των μέσων που θέλουν να κάνουν κάτι διαφορετικό. Δεν θα σας πω πολλά για το, την κατάσταση στη χώρα μας. Τα είπαμε με τους εργολάβους και πλειοκτήτες, ιδιοκτήτες των μέσων και όταν λέμε το μέσον, μιλάμε για όλα τα mainstream μέσα, όλη, όλη την, την κορυφή. Θα σας πω όμως ότι ε, η εφημερίδα, η μεγαλύτερη κυκλοφορία εφημερίδα ε, της Ελλάδας έκανε ένα ρεπορτάζ για μια συνάντηση του Έλληνα Πρωθυπουργού με τον Τούρκο ομόλογό του, ε, στην οποία δημοσίευσε εκτός από τις φωτογραφίες και τις επίσημες δηλώσεις τους και στοιχεία από το τι διεμήφθη εκτός της συνάντησης, δηλαδή τα off the record που είπανε. Αλλά δεν έγινε ποτέ αυτή η συνάντηση. Για να προλάβουν την εκτύπωση, είχαν κάνει το ρεπορτάζ και τελικά, λόγω ενός συμβάντος, η συνάντηση δεν έγινε ποτέ. Οπότε στην εφημερίδα είχαμε ένα ρεπορτάζ για κάτι που δεν έγινε ποτέ. Και αυτό είναι δείγμα της ποιότητα που έχει φτάσει στην Ελλάδα. Στην υπόθεση του 2008, με το θάνατο ενός 14χρονου μαθητή, του Αλέξανδρου Γρηγορόπουλου, το νούμερο ένα τηλεοπτικό δελτίο, το μεγαλύτερο σε τηλεθέαση τηλεοπτικό δελτίο, έπαιζε ένα, ένα ντοκουμέντο, το οποίο ήταν παραποιημένο, είχαν μέσα βάλει ήχους από, άλλες, από άλλα ρεπορτάζ, προκειμένου να φαίνεται ότι υπήρχε συγκρούσει αναρχικών με την αστυνομία που οδήγησαν τελικά στην τηλεφωνία. Ενώ, όπως αποδείχθηκε, από ένα απλό βίντεο που αναρτήθηκε στο YouTube από κάποιον που, το, που ήταν στο περιστατικό, ήταν ένα ψεύτικο ρεπορτάζ. Αυτό το Μέγκα, αυτό το κανάλι, ζήτησε συγγνώμη γι' αυτό το 2012. Τέσσερα χρόνια μετά παραδέχτηκε ότι είχε γίνει αυτή η παραποίηση. Ας μην πω πολλά για το, για το τι άλλο συμβαίνει στην Ελλάδα. Θα πω απλώς ότι στην πραγματικότητα υπάρχει η πιο καλή και πιο, ε, στο extreme εφαρμογή του δόγματος του σοκ που έχει περιγράψει ε, η Naomi Klein. Είναι, ε, είναι εφαρμοσμένο, υπάρχει ένας μονόδρομος και μια τρομοκρατία. Ο κόσμος βομβαρδίζεται καθημερινά με σενάρια καταστροφής για οποιοδήποτε άλλο, εκτός από αυτό που έχουν να παρουσιάσουν τα συμφέροντα των συγκεκριμένων εργολάβων και οι εφοπλιστών που στην πραγματικότητα και τώρα είναι κάπως εγκλωβισμένοι γιατί χρωστάνε πολλά στις τράπεζες. Ε, να περάσω αυτά. Να, ξα... να πω μόνο ένα τελευταίο. Ε, όπως σας είπα, μια άλλη εφημερίδα, η καθημερινή, πολύ γνωστή εφημερίδα, δημοσίευσε ένα άλλο ρεπορτάζ στο οποίο ήταν στο οικονομικό δελτίο και ο... ο... Ο διορθωτή ξέχασε να σβήσει τη σημειώση του αρχισυντάκτη από πάνω, οποίε δημοσιεύτηκαν μαζί, που έλεγε ότι, κοιτάξτε να δείτε, ε, αυτό θα τον προσέξετε, γιατί είναι one of our guys. So θα πρέπει οπωσδήποτε, επειδή είναι δικό μα, να το ρεπορτάζ να είναι φιλικό προ αυτόν. Και αυτό δημοσιεύτηκε, γιατί ε, η κρίση έχει και περικοπέ στου διορθωτέ, οπότε βγαίνουν όλα στη φόρα. Ε, ο υπεύθυνο του οικονομικού αυτή τη εφημερίδα 
Είναι ο επίσημος εκπρόσωπος τύπου μία από τις τέσσερις μεγαλύτερες τράπεζες στην Ελλάδα. Δηλαδή, έχουμε το φοβερό να έχουμε έναν δημοσιογράφο με συμφέροντα, τα συμφέροντα των τραπεζιτών. Και η διαφήμιση στην Ελλάδα που θα ήταν ένα οικονομικό μοντέλο που θα μπορούσε να τη στηρίξει, γιατί δεν εμπιστευόμαστε τους εκδότες, εφοπλιστές και εργολάβους που χρησιμοποιούν τα ΜΜΕ για να κάνουν συμβόλαια. Το, ο άλλο πυλώνα που θα μπορούσε να, να χρηματοδοτήσει τα μέσα που είναι η διαφήμιση ελέγχεται απόλυτα. Γιατί θα φανταζόσασταν ότι σε μια χώρα η οποία οι τράπεζε ουσιαστικά έχουν καταρρεύσει και χρηματοδοτούνται από τον Ευρωπαϊκό Μηχανισμό Στήριξη, ότι η διαφήμιση θα είχε πέσει. Στην πραγματικότητα έχει ανέβει η διαφήμιση των τραπεζών. Στην προσπάθειά του να ελέγξουν το τι λέγεται για αυτέ, η διαφήμιση των τραπεζών στην Ελλάδα καταλαμβάνουν το 65% τη διαφημιστική πίτα στο σύνολό τη. Ε, οπότε και οι διαφημίσεις είναι δύσκολο, είναι δύσκολο να, να αξιοποιηθούν και να στηριχθεί ένα μοντέλο. Έχουν μείνει λίγα μοντέλα. Οι συνδρομές, πολύ δύσκολο πράγμα για μέσα, ιδίω μέσα σαν τα ελληνικά, τα οποία δεν μιλάνε μια παγκόσμια γλώσσα. Το κοινό είναι ήδη μικρότερο, είναι δύσκολο να πεις κόσμο να βάλει χρήματα. Τα donations, δωρεέ. Και αυτέ δεν έχουν, στην Ελλάδα δεν έχει εμπεδωθεί ακριβώ το συνέστημα το ότι πρέπει να πληρώσει την είδησή σου. Και είναι, είναι κρίμα γιατί ιδίω στην Ελλάδα ισχύει ότι αν δεν πληρώσει για την είδηση που θα λάβει, κάποιο άλλο θα την πληρώσει για σένα. Και αυτό ο άλλο έχει διαφορετικά συνήθω συμφέροντα σε σχέση με τα δικά σου. Ε, οπότε η, η ομιλία μου όταν είχα ξεκινήσει ήταν κάτι πολύ πιο μεγάλο επίβολο και δεν χωράει σε 10 λεπτά, ήθελα να μιλήσω λίγο για την ανάγκη να αναμορφωθεί ε, ο τύπος μέσα από τα οικονομικά του μοντέλα. Γιατί πρέπει να, κακά τα ψέματα να μιλήσουμε για το πώς ε, θα πάμε από εδώ και πέρα. Γιατί, όπως γράφουμε και στο πρώτο μας editorial, ο ναι μεν παλιός κόσμος πέθανε, ο δε νέος δεν πληρώνει καθόλου καλά. Ε, οπότε, αυτό που θέλαμε να κάνουμε είναι να, να παρουσιάσουμε ένα ένα συνολικό μοντέλο. Εμείς στο Press Project είμαστε, βασιζόμαστε σε μια εταιρεία πληροφορική, η οποία μας δίνει κάποιες παραπάνω δυνατότητες. Για παράδειγμα, μια που μιλάμε για ελευθερία του τύπου, έχουμε δημιουργήσει ένα, ένα μηχανισμό όπου συλλέξαμε 10,5 εκατομμύρια έγγραφα από το σύστημα το, που είναι υποχρεωμένο βάσει νόμου το κράτος να κρατάει τις πληροφορίες όλες τις αποφάσεις που παίρνει το κράτος το οποίο όμως ύστερα τις πήρε, εφόσον βγήκε αυτός ο νόμος, τις, ε, έβαλε όλες σε, σε μια βάση δεδομένων και έφτιαξε μια μηχανή αναζήτησης που είναι πρακτικά αδύνατο να βρεις αυτό που ψάχνεις, γιατί βάζοντας μια λέξη κλειδί, σου δείχνει μόνο 200 από τα αποτελέσματα από τα πιθανά 50.000 που σε ενδιαφέρουν και τα κάνει short ανάποδα, τα, τα αξιολόγια ανάποδα, οπότε βλέπεις τα τελευταία 200 πιο άχρηστα από αυτά που υπάρχουν. Οπότε εμείς με τη τεχνολογική μας δυνατότητα, μαζέψαμε αυτά τα έγγραφα, μαζέψαμε όλο το αρχείο των ελληνικών τραπεζών μέσα από το Εθνικό Τυπογραφείο, μαζέψαμε όλα τα προγράμματα κοινοτική στήριξης από την Ευρωπαϊκή Ένωση και φτιάξαμε ένα μηχανισμό που λέγεται Search Lab, με τον οποίο μπορείς να μπεις και να κοιτάξεις μια εταιρεία, τι σχέση έχει με το δημόσιο, ποιοι είναι μέσα στο ΔΣ αυτής της εταιρείας, σε ποια άλλα ΔΣ βρίσκονται. Και απλώς θα σας πω ένα πολύ χαρακτηριστικό παράδειγμα, ότι χτυπώντας το όνομα ενός περιφερειάρχη της Ελλάδας, ε, βλέπεις ότι η εταιρεία του αδερφού του, η οποία έκανε τζίρο 100.000 ευρώ σε συμβόλαια δημοσίου μέχρι να εκλεγεί, τώρα παίρνει γύρω στα 11 εκατομμύρια το χρόνο από τότε που εξελέγει. Ε, η τεχνολογία, λοιπόν, είναι κάτι στο οποίο βασιζόμαστε, για να φτιάξουμε δημοσιογραφία που είναι διαφορετική. Ε, προσπαθούμε να μειώσουμε τις εξαρτήσεις μας με τις τράπεζες. Είμασταν το πρώτο μέσο στην Ελλάδα, έχουν ακολουθήσει πολλά. Ε, το πιο χαρακτηριστικό που επίσης το καταλαβαίνει τον πόνο μας, δεν δεχόμαστε διαφημίσεις ούτε από τράπεζες, ούτε από, από κρατικό χρήμα. Ε, το ξέρουν τα παιδιά από το Ανφόλο, το κάνουν επίσης. Εμείς, ως εταιρεία πληροφορική, το πήγαμε και ένα βήμα παραπάνω, δηλαδή εκτός ότι για το πρέσι δεν παίρνουμε τέτοια συμβόλαια. Δεν το κάνουμε ούτε για την εταιρεία πληροφορική, ώστε να μην υπάρχει κάποιο, κάποιο conflict σε αυτά. Ε, ζητάμε από τον κόσμο να χρηματοδοτήσει συγκεκριμένα project, όταν έκλεισε η ΕΡΤ, εκείνο το βράδυ που σας είπα, ανάμεσα στη συγκινητική στιγμή με τους δημοσιογράφους, ήταν και η ομάδα του Δεπρέση, η οποία κατάφερε, λόγω μιας φοβερής συγκυρίας που δεν έχω να σας πω, αλλά έχει πολύ πλάκα, να, κατα... να... να κατασυνεχίσουμε τη μετάδοση της ΕΡΤ μέσα από το διαδίκτυο για 5,5 μήνες, φτάνοντας μάλιστα στο πρώτο μήνα να έχουμε 4,5 εκατομμύρια συνολικές θεάσεις, με πίκ το 1,5 εκατομμύριο ταυτόχρονα οι άνθρωποι να παρακολουθούν 
την κρατική τηλεόραση, που ήταν η πρώτη πραγματικά κρατική τηλεόραση. Ο Πρωθυπουργός... Excuse me, could I ask you to come to an end? Yes, of course. Okay. Ε... Οπότε, προσπαθώντας να φτάσω στο τέλος, θα ήθελα να σα πω ότι αυτό που θέλουμε να κάνουμε είναι να, να ψάξουμε να βρούμε ένα μοντέλο το οποίο μπορεί να δώσει λύσει, το οποίο είναι ένα πολλαπλό μοντέλο. Να οργανώσουμε συναυλίε υποστήριξη, να πείσουμε τον κόσμο να κάνει micro donations, να φτιάξουμε ένα συνδρομητικό, ένα συνδρομητικό σύστημα, στο οποίο όμω η συνδρομή σου θα σου δίνει περισσότερα εργαλεία, αλλά ποτέ περισσότερη πληροφορία, γιατί η πληροφορία πρέπει να είναι πάντα δημόσια σε όλου. Να προσπαθήσουμε να κάνουμε επιχειρηματικά διαφήμιση σε πολλά μέσα, να κάνουμε περισσότερε συνεργασίε. Ε, δεν έχω χρόνο να το συζητήσουμε πάρα πολύ. Θα υπάρχει και μια, ένα αναλυτικό άρθρο που θα βγει και στα αγγλικά στο Press Project ε, την επόμενη εβδομάδα που είναι όλο η παρουσίαση του οικονομικού μοντέλου. Σας ευχαριστώ πολύ για αυτή την υπέροχη οργάνωση. Thank you very much, um, particularly for explaining ways in which media and the work of journalists can be financed alternatively. I also found your comments regarding the impact of the government's opinion on the public and um, how it impacts journalists incredibly helpful uh, and important. And I would personally be curious to compare the impact of the economic crisis on the journalists in Greece with the impact of the aftermath of 9-11, of September 11th, on how journalists reacted at that time to that particular public pressure. I think that would be worth exploring. But right now, uh, it is for Spider Alex, uh, and thanks to those who helped put up the presentation. Please. Okay. Okay. So first of all, thank you for the organization to having me here. And it was really nice to meet the Greek and the Vienna connection, very inspiring. So first of all, I would like to, to explain that I come from Spain, which is another country that is used as a laboratory to test how far neoliberalist policy can squeeze citizens. Personally, I do not believe in the word crisis. For me, it is an organized criminal partnership between corrupted politicians in one hand and the financial and banking system in the other hand. It is a large uh, global scale robbery based in the selling of the commons and the privatization of everything. But Dimitri asked me to bring an optimist note <laughs> to the conference. So I'm going to talk about the bright side of this situation, which is that citizenship is learning fast. And we are summing now very interesting bottom up mobilizations and new forms of self organization stemming from civil society for civil society. This translates into an intensive experimentation around post-capitalist new forms of production and redistribution of wellness based in the development of new social rules. Um, here I'm going to address more specifically the dimension of how civil society is contributing to the development of freedom and appropriated technologies to cover our everyday needs in relation to information, communication and expression. So the first thing that we should know <laughs> when we think about technological sovereignty is that we need to make a shift on the imaginaries that we have regarding who produce and who develop technologies. Generally, when we think about who do that, we think either a military, a crazy sci scientist working for the military industrial complex, or we think on young males, white generally, that become really rich before 30 years and we've got some examples here in the left. And if we make a revision of the biographies of those persons, generally they are kind of misogynist and misanthropic. They don't really love humankind. And it's kind of scary to think that those persons are the persons that design and maintain the platforms that we use to maintain our social networks and relationships. But there's a lot of contribution from ever of civil society to the development of technologies. For instance, the development of communal radios and uh, television broadcasting, the launch by radio amateurs of the first non-military satellite into orbit, 
the first news portal on internet with an open anonymous publication system was not launched by 2.0 companies. It was launched by Indie Media Network in 1999. And finally, of course, who did invent free software and free open license? It was not companies, it was not militars, it was civil society. So here, for instance, we've got two examples. This is the place where I live. We are all the time making like development of freedom technologies. So you can see, I mean, we can all, and we are all contributing to technological developments. It's not something that is part of just the company world. So, the slides complicate, okay. So why do we talk about technological sovereignty in Spain? First, because it allows us to make a smart analogy with the idea of food sovereignty, the idea of slow food, of zero kilometer food, agroecological food. This is something people understand better in general, that we need to buy directly food that is produced in good social and environmental conditions. And this importance that we give to food, no? to food producing good conditions is reflected in the multiplication of small scale initiatives where citizens organize among themselves to buy directly the agroecological food they need. So why are we not applying the same logic to the producers of the technologies that we need in our everyday lives in the same way we do with the lettuce and the carrots? because technologies every time is more important in our everyday life. We use it to manage our social relation, for entertainment, for work, for employment, for relation with the state, etc. And so I think that the reason that we don't apply the same logic is in one hand because there's a lack of understanding of the challenges that are implied by the type of technologies that we use and in general we consume rather passively. And obviously, there's also very bad public policies in relation to digital inclusion and education to the so-called new technologies. And then we also use the word technological sovereignty because lately the world of free and open has become very complex. This last year, there's been many commercial companies like Google, but also governments that have entered in this world. So now we've got open data, we've got hackathons organized by public institutions, we've got open educational resource set up by higher education institutions. It looks like everything has gone open. However, many times this is caused not by a true understanding of the importance of developing and reinforcing the commons as a public good, or to strengthen the basic four freedoms implied by free software. It is in general more linked to budget constraints and to create through crowdsourcing new forms of labor exploitation. So we have to be careful in that sense to try to make a difference. Now we talk about technological sovereignty in Spain, at least. Mm -mm -mm. So what would be, I mean, the, the, the current panorama of technological sovereignty initiatives is very rich and very heterogeneous. I will show it later. But what would be the commonalities those initiatives share together? So first, and this is very important, they are not for profit. Their main motivation is to develop useful and appropriated technologies to cover our needs. They generally come from the stomach and the heart. So this is really important. They try to create and maintain real technological alternatives to commercial and military technologies. They defend technodiversity. I mean, if we need uh, eco-diversity, we need technodiversity. Even if Facebook was the better platform in the world, and it is not, we cannot all be there. I mean, seeing the same color, the same interface. This is technological poverty. I mean, it's boring besides. And the other um, commonality is that they generally look for decentralization and the, to remove useless intermediaries. Then, of course, they use free software and, when possible, free hardware. They release the knowledge they produce under open or free licenses, but their characteristic, it goes beyond that, because their own existence already generates social and political transformation, because their existence empowers their users, the developers, the participants to those initiatives, because it makes a mix between do-it-yourself dynamics and do-it-together dynamics, and this is really empowering to learn together how to use and develop appropriate technologies. Then the generally those initiatives that are embedded inside social economy dynamics, such as cooperatives, peer-to-peer -peer exchange, time banks, social money, gift economies, these kind of, these kind of things. No? And finally, they actively oppose techno 
technological fetishism. You know, those people that line for the, lack, the last Mac, Macintosh for hours, for instance, that this is technological fetishism. And also they oppose a program obsolescence because they always try to prolongate as possible the life of the service, the devices or the infrastructure they are creating. So I have to drink a little bit. Because <laughs> Ah, yes, thanks. So now I'm just going to go through the diversity of um, the diversity of fields of experimentation. Thank you. <laughs> One minute. Okay, I go through. Pa, pa. So free software, you already know. They explained yesterday. I mean, the only software that makes sense is free software. Then we need uh, internet service, service providers that are coming from citizenship and mesh networks. We need a free internet that remains uh, neutral, uh, based on neutrality uh, and open to everybody. That doesn't censor, that doesn't filter. Free hardware, it's more tricky. I won't go in details, but there's a lot of experimentation in developing free hardware. And of course, we need autonomous servers. We need everybody has to take <laughs> a small computer in his house and settle the server. We need to have access to our own data. It cannot be in the hands of commercial companies. Then, yes, there's a lot of experimentation in decentralized social networks. So yes, there's alternatives to Facebook, Twitter, and so on. Okay, they, they are uh, shutting down public libraries. We can make our own. We've got the medium, there's no problem. We make our scanner and we make our server and we make digital public libraries, no problem. We make circumvention tools, so you try to stop our internet, pues we make something to bypass it and keep internet open. Uh, don't hate the bank, be the bank. There's a lot of experimentation around cryptocurrencies and social money and this is really interesting. Yeah, for Greece and Spain. <laughs> yes, we need also uh, alternative search engines. We cannot let Google organize all the knowledge in the world, not, not possible. And there's even a lot of experimentation with spatial exploration. And I think that for when they cut you the broadcasting on television, it's good to have your satellite <laughs> to keep the broadcasting of your television. So there's some experimentation around this field also. So it's kind of cool. So what are the spaces we need to enable this experimentation? We need uh, fab labs makers everywhere, we need hack labs and hacker space, and we need bio labs. So I think that it's important that abandoned spaces are transformed in a gathering for the communities and the neighborhood where people can learn and exchange together and make these kind of developments. So in Spain we say that uh, solas no podemos, juntas podemos con todo. That means uh, alone we cannot, but together maybe we can do e everything. And uh, I would say that it's really important that uh, if you want to support your own free internet, if you want to protect internet and technologies in general, you have to give value to those alternatives. You have to make a contribution. We are not uh, service providers. You have to give time or passions or documentation or translation or donations, why not? So the idea is let us, no, help us to help you. <laughs> so that's the idea. Thank you. Thank you very much for a very rich list of opportunities and possibilities of developing alternatives. I do have to say your remarks on how new social media rules have to be developed sounds a lot like the McBride report by UNESCO in 1980, um, but I think that'll be a topic in and of itself. Without further ado, I'd like to pass the floor on to Anna Hintz, who is a lecturer at the University of Cardiff, uh, School of Journalism, Media and Cultural Studies. He's published substantially on the question of um, social media and global governance, and he works, among others, uh, for the, no, sorry, he is the chair of the community communication section of the International Association for Media and Communication Research. The floor is yours. Okay. 
one button is usually really helpful. Um, okay, thank you very much. Um, what I'd like to do is, is basically to, um, to outline a spectrum of, of strategies, uh, a landscape of repertoires of action that advocates and activists have used to influence media policy. And we'll come back to the technology briefly, but the focus is um, uh, yeah, different, different ways in which people have tried to influence policy. And what I want to suggest at the end of the day really is that we're strong if we connect different um, repertoires of action, combine different vectors of, of policy change. So the first strategy that we may want to consider, of course, um, protests, um, public expressions of outrage. There have been very um, interesting examples over the past few years, um, such as online actions, the SOPA PIPA protests in the US in 2012, for example. SOPA was the Stop Online Privacy Act, which was criticized for threatening free speech and innovation. So on 18th January 2012, thousands of websites had a coordinated blackout. It was like an online strike action um, websites including Wikipedia, Google and others. Online protests have been, have, have been quite, quite interesting, quite successful. Also we've seen street protests uh, against surveillance for example. For many years now um, there have been the so-called freedom not fear demonstrations in Berlin and elsewhere uh, once every year with sometimes tens of thousands of participants out on the street protesting particularly against uh, the EU data retention directive and similar uh, surveillance measures. And of course with the Snowden revelations now the topic has renewed and increased its relevance and we've seen that for example with the, with the Stop Watching Us uh, protests on 26 October last year in Washington DC. So that's protest. Other forms of advocacy, um, well there, there are a range of, of advocacy forms of course that have been used and are continuing to be used, lobbying relevant institutions, um, participation in international multi-stakeholder fora, people and, and relevant organizations in our field are participating, for example, in fora like the, the Internet Governance Forum or ICANN and so on. Public campaigns, we've heard about in a national campaign earlier, there are in international, also European campaigns, there's for example one right now that's called um, savetheinternet.eu, uh, it opposes a current EU proposal to limit and compromise the principle of uh, net neutrality, so if you haven't heard about it, uh, check it out, savetheinternet.eu. So these campaigns and, and, and advocacy initiatives, of course, put pressure on politicians and, and policy makers uh, to influence their behavior, but also about public awareness raising. And these are perhaps the classic repertoires for influencing policy, but there are others. There's a the legal side, which is kind of, in some situations, kind of interesting, I think. For example, um, there's a court case at the moment by the Open Rights Group in the UK uh, and by other organizations also against mass surveillance. They have brought the UK government to court, to the European Court of Human Rights in this case, and they allege that the government acted illegally by breaching the privacy of the UK and of UK and European citizens and that it broke Article 8 of the European Human Rights Act, which is about the right uh, to respect for private and family life, uh, home and correspondence from arbitrary interference by the state. And so, of course, then the question will be in which way has surveillance been arbitrary? And the goal, again, there is, of course, to, uh, to reach a positive verdict and change government uh, behavior, but also public awareness raising. So uh, the legal aspect, we've heard just about the technology, and I think, uh, I won't go back into all of that, but I think it's an important piece of the puzzle, really. Also, even when we talk about more, more specific forms of, uh, of, of policy uh, interventions, uh, privacy by design is increasingly uh, important, the inclusion of privacy in, in technological platforms by default, in, encryption tools, PGP, Tor, and so on, and other forms of circumvention and security, and we've just heard uh, about the use of non-commercial email providers, social media platforms, and so on. Christian Fuchs also talked about this earlier. Is that policy? Well, it is perhaps um, the most original and fundamental form of policy making, definitely in the field of internet governance, if we think about how the internet was created, how the protocols were created, and so on. Um, but arguably also in earlier technological cycles, such as the radio or the telegraph. As Lawrence Lessig famously said, uh, code is law as it predetermines other forms of regulation. And many media activists and developers today prefer code-related interventions still to other forms uh, of policy intervention. But then there's a fifth area that I find particularly interesting actually right now, um, and just a couple more minutes on that perhaps, and something which I would call policy hacking uh, or DIY policy making, do-it-yourself policy making, uh, which would be initiatives mostly by civil society groups, sometimes including companies, um, 
and other institutions that develop and then propose new laws and policies themselves. So it's about, well, it, it actually goes beyond a little bit um, a classic advocacy because it's not primarily about influencing others uh, who create policy, but about creating policy yourself. It has some similarities perhaps with the fourth strategy, um, technology, because it's about creating, it's about developing prefigurative action rather than demanding, hence policy hacking. So there are examples interesting, from a technical perspective, some interesting uh, examples like policy hackathons, uh, where people usually with technical skills come together to analyze and sometimes improve policies. There are things like, for example, the annual uh, EU hackathon organized by uh, civil society groups, including ETRI, I think, and, and also the EFF and so on, and some companies like Google, uh, and annual events to analyze and understand current issues of internet policy. Last year, I think it was about surveillance, um, of course. I think it was called Hack for Your Rights. Uh, but more than that, I think it's interesting to look at the practices of um, civil society coalitions that actually develop uh, new law. We've heard earlier about the um, Austrian Transparency Initiative. In the city where I used to live for a while, in Hamburg, there's been something similar. The, uh, the Hamburg Transparency Law Initiative, also a civil society coalition with the goal to initiate a new and radical open data law for the city in this case. Um, and they thought about creating a big campaign to put pressure on the local government to create such a law. Um, but they also thought, why not just write it ourselves? Uh, so they collected best practices from other countries and adapted them to the local situation. Uh, and put their proposal on a public wiki where it was discussed and amended. Uh, and then in uh, 2012, the local parliament, uh, local city council adopted the new law. That's not the whole story. It's just a part of the story. But I think it's kind of an interesting part of that story. There are other interesting examples like that, I think. IMI, the Icelandic Modern Media Initiative, may be one of them, which was also a coalition um, to create a comprehensive legal framework that protects and strengthens freedom of information, whistleblowing, and so on, and prevent all kinds of censorship. And the way to get there, again, was by writing the law, or at least an outline uh, of a legal package based on an inventory of good legal practices in other countries. And in 2010, it was adopted by the Icelandic parliament in principle. Some of the components, the laws have been uh, implemented since then. We, we can go beyond Europe. We can look at Argentina, where there has been um, uh, an Argentinian coalition for democratic broadcasting, which uh, was, I think, created about 10 years ago, which advocated for a new national audiovisual media law to replace the old law which was still from the times of the military dictatorship. Uh, so what they did is they created a regulatory blueprint. A coalition member was then charged by the government in this case um, to draft the new law based on that blueprint and also based on some other uh, legal proposals, legislative proposals by organizations such as AMAC, the World Association of Community Broadcasters, there were open hearings and comments by civil society groups were included in the document uh, and then this document was ad more largely adopted by parliament in 2009. There are many other examples like this. Um, just, just the last one, European initiative to create uh, a model law on net neutrality that we've seen uh, recently. Members of digital, European digital rights groups have uh, come together to des have decided to draft a model law and promote its adoption by European governments. Also, again, starting with an inventory of legislation in other countries and some principles for a model net neutrality law and then with the goal to, to create something and then pr promote it. Um, I think it's interesting, well it is of course definitely interesting to analyze all this further, so this is just, these are just a little, this is just a sketch basically, um, to look at success factors, some um, academic disciplines like policy studies and social movement studies are very helpful in this, looking for example at the strategic, strategic use of policy windows, temporary openings such as crises, such as political change, how they can help with this, um, are the importance of individuals, sympathetic individuals inside policy making institutions, uh, the role of policy transfer, policy diffusion and so on. Um, but the, m the main point that I just wanted to make here is um, yeah, that there is this variety of strategies and we've heard more uh, already now in this final session and we've heard more uh, during these two days. Um, and often they're more, they are successful when they're integrated and connected. The development of the broadcast law in Argentina was accompanied by street protests and, and demonstrations. 
current lobby efforts by the European, uh, by, the, by the Open Rights Group in the UK against mass surveillance are complemented by the lawsuit that I mentioned. They're also complemented by organizing crypto parties. We've heard about them earlier, um, public events to teach and learn about uh, anonymization tools and secure communication online. Uh, there are many other examples and, and experiences. The, the legalization of community radio, community radio was mentioned earlier, is, is often in many countries a long struggle over several decades that includes um, collaborations with governments, um, but also illegal um, pirate broadcasting and protests and so on. So the point is basically, Sorry. I think we, we have a range of, of action repertoires at our disposal. Uh, let's use them. Thank you, wonderful. Thank you so very much. Um, also about strategic litigation at the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, the whole question of civil society or non-governmental entities creating policy, I think that raises some very important questions on who's going to pay for that. If I think of some very interested lobbying like industries um, that would take on a very particular role um, in that. And also, thank you very much for highlighting so many opportunities to make clear to governments that participation is easily possible through media um, and not quite as complicated as they sometimes like to make one believe. Our next speaker is Andreas Grisch. He's the president of European Digital Rights, um, based in Belgium, and um, is on the Austrian Working Group on Data Retention, Vorrat.at. And I understand you're also on the Austrian Data Protection um, Commission. The Council, sorry, excuse me. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to touch on a few points that uh, Anna just, uh, just mentioned. Uh, I think uh, the European Digital Rights is, uh, for, for giving you a context, the umbrella organization of uh, 35 uh, data protection and human rights organizations from 20 European countries. We are based in Brussels. Uh, Open Rights Group uh, in the UK is one of our member organizations, uh, but we also have members in Germany, the Chaos Computer Group, for example, and uh, in Austria, uh, Quintessence and my home organization, the uh, Association for Internet Users uh, Austria. Uh, we work since uh, 2002 together to, to address uh, European policymakers uh, on digital rights issues, and uh, one of the first things that we that we had to deal with uh, was uh, data re uh, retention. Uh, obviously, it uh, already started uh, around 2002, 2003. The first discussions about this idea to have mandatory, mandatory data retention, uh, and uh, since then we are working on this topic, for example. So it's uh, already a very long time. Uh, one of the, the biggest successes, of course, in the in the last time has uh, been uh, ACTA, the Anti Counterfeiting Trade Agreement, and uh, international the. the proposal of an international agreement on uh, anti-counterfeiting measures that uh, tried to abandon the rule of law and, and uh, other important uh, rights. And this has been uh, rejected by the European Parliament uh, after the protests that have uh, been coordinated and, and also carried out by some of our members, but of course also of other organizations, not only us. Uh, and, and lots and lots of individuals who were in the streets in, in Europe and uh, we had thousands of uh, demonstrations and the like. Uh, so we have been very successful with that and uh, so one could think, well, it's everything is fine, we, we uh, have a victory here and uh, let's see what's the next thing that we can do. Uh, but I'm not sure if, if uh, it really was, the success was, was uh, really uh, final, so to say. But I will come back to that in, in a minute. Uh, regarding data retention, I already said we, we are working on this specific topic for already for 10 years now and uh, still have no final solution to the problem. Uh, we had uh, constitutional court cases in several countries in Europe, Germany, for example, the constitutional court rejected the, the law in Germany. In Romania, uh, the, it was challenged and rejected uh, in the Czech Republic and so on. So there are a number of countries where these laws have uh, been, been challenged in court and uh, have been rejected, but still uh, the directive, uh, the European directive is still uh, in place. And what we did here in Austria uh, two years ago was 
was uh, were two things. One of these was to uh, initiate a citizens' initiative uh, that uh, aimed to to uh, that addressed the, the, the Austrian uh, Parliament to. Uh, settle its position on the European level. So to, to say uh, that Austria formally uh, vetoes data retention on European level. This was the, the first thing that we demanded and the second thing was uh, that uh, we wanted an independent evaluation of the existing surveillance laws uh, present in Austria. So uh, scientific evaluation of the existing law where we can see, okay, is, are these laws useful? Uh, is this, this something that we should maintain or are there laws that should be abandoned because they uh, give no, no benefit to the society at large. Uh, this uh, citizens' initiative uh, received 106,070 uh, 106, uh, uh, signatures. It was one of the largest uh, in the Second Republic in Austria. Uh, the result of this citizens' initiative was that uh, on the, 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 the majority, the government majority in the parliament uh, decided to not even give a single answer to our demands. So they did not even touch the topic that we uh, suggested, but said, uh, yes, uh, data retention was uh, uh, implemented in Austria in compliance with the, with the regulation. We never asked if this uh, is the case. Our question was to position Austria on European level, but they did not even touch the topic. This is not very, very uh, encouraging. Uh, but uh, they also decided that if there is a court case uh, that uh, makes it necessary to change the law, then the government should come up with, uh, with uh, repairing uh, a law and, and provisions that uh, would solve the problem. Well, uh, this means, so first we as activists have to be uh, successful in court, that our parliament will act on our citizens' initiative that was supported by 106,000 people. Uh, we at this time already were at the court because we also uh, made a constitutional complaint in Austria which was supported by 11,000 uh, citizens uh, of, of Austria and uh, this constitutional complaint also uh, led to the, to the decision of the Constitutional Court to uh, refer the case to the European uh, Court of Justice because our Constitutional Court said they have uh, some doubts if the data retention directive is in line uh, with the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union. So currently, together with, uh, with the Irish initiative that also challenged uh, data retention in their country, uh, we now have a case at the ECJ and the situation is this, that the Advocate General uh, already said in uh, his uh, opinion that he thinks that the, the directive is in violation of the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union. Uh, we do not uh, fully agree with, with his reasoning, but uh, in, the, uh, in, in uh, this assessment that is uh, not compliant, we, we <coughs> totally agree, of course, and uh, we are expecting a ruling in, in the next month, so we will see. Uh, but still, this is the, after an effort of 10 years of really a large number of people all over Europe who challenged this law. So it's really hard work to address such topics. And when I now come back to, to ACTA and, and all, all these provisions that have been in this uh, uh, proposed agreement, then we now see that all of these things now come via the back door. They did not stop to, to follow these, uh, these ideas. They just said, uh, okay, we can't come through the front door, so we uh, need to take the back door. And uh, now we see that uh, private companies do, in fact, enforce things that are not even in the law. One very prominent case uh, is, is the case of WikiLeaks, for example. WikiLeaks uh, had never and still has never been accused of breaking any law, but still the Vice President of the United States publicly accused the organization of being a high-tech terrorist organization, and following this statement of the Vice President, Visa, MasterCard, PayPal decided to stop any money transfers to this organization. So simply by the statement of a, of a government uh, representative, uh, the, the result was that this organization was not able to receive any funds anymore. 
we have a similar situation with uh, providers of virtual private networks. Uh, virtual private networks is an encryption technology that enables you to uh, communicate uh, securely via the internet. It, it creates a tunnel between your computer and uh, your home base, uh, your company, for example, uh, that is uh, not able to be, to be uh, spied upon. And uh, what we see in Sweden is uh, that uh, it is no longer allowed for such companies providing such services to receive money. Uh, again, Visa, Visa and MasterCard uh, declined to, to uh, give uh, money to them that was sent by, by individuals who want to buy their services. So it's, there is a, a restriction uh, to, to provide such services simple because private companies deny to do this business uh, based on uh, initiatives of, of uh, governments, of uh, politicians, without legal basis. Uh, I can't uh, ex uh, tell the big picture, uh, the, the whole picture, but there is uh, this booklet that we just published. It is called Human Rights and Privatized Law Enforcement. The title is a bit mit uh, misleading because often it's just enforcement and not law enforcement because in the, there is no law in the first place, uh, but uh, just the wish of, of politicians. And uh, it's uh, available via our website, uh, itwe.org, uh, where you can uh, freely uh, download it and, and uh, read it. Uh, I think the, the, main, the main point uh, is that we need constantly demand the protection of our fundamental rights. Every day and everybody of us. We need to demand proper enforcement of our fundamental rights. If you have a look on the, on the data protection uh, topic, we have discussions on a reform of the data protection uh, framework in the European Union uh, for two, two and a half years now. And what we clearly see from all the discussions that we have seen before is that we have currently quite some good legislation in place. It's not that bad. Of course, the reform is needed, but it's, it's, not, it's not that bad. Uh, but what we really have as a problem is enforcement of these laws. There is all over Europe, and uh, the, the initiative Europe versus Facebook is a, is a good example for that, uh, really a problem to, to get these fundamental rights uh, into practice, to, to have uh, it, it enforced. And then when I have a look at the situation in Austria, where our data protection uh, authority uh, nearly has no funds at all, they do not even have technicians who are able to, to do inspections at companies or, or data uh, processors, uh, then there is a clear need for improvement of enforcement. And uh, of course, the reform package uh, is, is uh, very much needed, but uh, especially we also need funds uh, in there uh, for, the, for the authorities uh, that are competent to, to make this enforcement. So we nearly clearly need to, to articulate what we expect from our politicians, and this is my last point already. Uh, and we also created a tool that uh, we, where we envision that uh, citizens as well as politicians get the chance to clearly communicate uh, what they think about uh, fundamental digital rights. And uh, we created a charter of digital, digital rights uh, with, with 10 points and, and put it on a website. It's the website wepromise.eu. And on this website, we create the possibilities for citizens to declare and to promise to vote at the upcoming uh, European elections for politicians, for candidates, who uh, declare that they will uh, respect these laws and that they will uh, act in accordance with this law and that they will, uh, will protect these uh, fundamental rights. And uh, on the other side, we also uh, give the opportunity for candidates for the, for the election to declare that they will uh, adhere to, this, uh, to these principles. So we have uh, on the one side the candidates that promise uh, to, to adhere to these uh, uh, rights and on the other hand the, the citizens who uh, promise to, to vote for candidates who declared to do so. And that's one thing that everybody can do now. Please go out, find your computer, go to wepromise.eu and declare that you will vote for someone who will, will protect our rights. Thank you. Thank you so very much, and I am glad that you did come up with something to do, because at some point uh, in your comments I was starting to feel rather bleak, uh, particularly when you were talking about the um, strategic litigation that 
you are currently uh, instigating in the European Court of Justice and the fact that the Advocate General is going to rely on the European Union's Fundamental Rights Charter. Uh, it's a wonderful document and it is definitely one that should be upheld, no question about that, but the Supreme Court of Austria uh, not, if, not quite two years ago actually ruled um, that the Charter of Fundamental Rights for the time being is only to apply in a very limited way. And for those of you who are not too familiar with the human rights situation in Austria, the uh, set of human rights that we actually have at the constitutional level dates back to 1867 under the rather authoritative rule of the then um, King and Emperor of Austria, Franz Josef. And the fact that the European um, Charter of Human Rights, uh, sorry, Convention of Human Rights, I should say, is in um, so-called constitutional majority is not due to Austria's high commitment uh, on human rights, but rather to the fact that there was a conflict uh, between lawyers at the time of adoption or ratification as to what nature an international treaty is and what place it takes within the Europe, uh, Austrian um, constitutional order. That said, I am not surprised by the reaction of the parliamentarians and the fact that they need babysitting in order to do something. With that, I'd like to turn to George Katrogalus, who was very kind um, to already give us a lot of insight on the Greek situation. I'd like to particularly pick you up uh, on the extensive work that you've done in advising other governments in Albania, Uzbekistan, Armenia, Syria, uh, the former um, uh, Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia, and um, the fact that you've also been an advisor to the Greek mission to the United Nations on human rights issues. I think there's a couple of recommendations for policy advice and also advocacy um, that you might have for us. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I have uh, already spoken myself. So in order to facilitate discussion, I just want to stress one important, in my opinion, issue. We are facing global issues. Our opponents are acting globally. And we, despite some best initiatives, some of which you have already heard at this panel, we are still acting mostly at the national level. And this contrasts sharply with other periods when the progressive forces have tried to coordinate themselves beyond national frontiers. You remember, for instance, that in the 30s, we had a lot of international conferences, let's say, of journalists against fascism. I think that now, beyond uh, uh, activist efforts uh, to influence legislation, it is important to create a transnational public space, the equivalent of a grassroots movement of the national standard type, but now transcend it beyond the national frontiers. And that not only by rallying around a central issue, in an effort to do, we, might, we should uh, try to do this as more permanent as it can become. And I think that technology can very, very, uh, can play a very important role in that. What uh, Spider Alex has said, I think it can be easily transferred from the domestic to the international level. And in my opinion, forums like this one must start a similar discussion on how we can build this transnational public space. Thank you. Thank you. With this call for action, thank you very much. Um, the space is yours. Who would like to make a comment or pose a question to the panelists? Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, my question is to Andreas. 
you underline the fact that the legislation is there, is in place, it's a question of enforcing it. Um, but with the industry lobbies being so strong and the commercial actors, is there really a chance of those legislative instruments being fully implemented? And, and even if they are at the national level, isn't the industry going to strike back? I don't mean to be pessimistic, but at the same time, it really requires a very strong determination and political will. And unfortunately, it's not, it doesn't seem to be there. For the data protection uh, framework that is ne negotiated on, on uh, EU level, I think uh, it's, it really, really seemed to, to be a lost battle uh, last year, until the mid of last year, let's say. But uh, in, in my uh, view, that it, was, it was one of the most important things that happened uh, that uh, Edward Snowden came forward with his uh, revelations. It really changed the, 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 the debate on, on European level entirely. Uh, we first had big problems with, uh, with uh, corporate lobbyists. Uh, I don't know if you, if you are aware of Lobbyplug, the, the website that uh, compared the, the uh, amendments, the proposed amendments with uh, the lobbying papers of, of companies, uh, where one could easily see how really it was legislation was copy pasted from corporate uh, lobby papers to, to uh, amendment proposals, uh, but it really changed entirely. Uh, when when uh, it became uh, public what the, what the uh, NSA, uh, GCHQ and, and uh, other organizations are doing. And uh, we saw that there was a very large majority in Libe Committee in, in the European Parliament uh, that uh, supported uh, very strong measures uh, and, a, and a very strong uh, proposal uh, for the data uh, protection uh, framework and there is now uh, again uh, very uh, high uh, sanctions, uh, a proposal for very high sanctions in, in the parliament proposal that is up to 5% of the annual turnover of uh, a company like Google, Facebook, etc. Uh, as a maximum uh, uh, fine for, for violating data protection rights and 5% of the annual turnover is quite a bit uh, and uh, so I think the, the chances are much better now, but still, of course, we, we need to, to uh, be aware that uh, companies do not just say, okay, we lost and now we go. Uh, of course, they, they uh, continue their, their lobbying work and they will continue to, to weaken or to, to find uh, places uh, to, to settle their, their headquarters in places where there is very weak uh, uh, enforcement of, the, of data protection law, as it is the case uh, in Ireland, for example, where you don't even have a chance to get uh, your uh, right to data protection uh, as a citizen. And uh, therefore, I think uh, that harmonization is one of the most important things that we need, and especially harmonization of enforcement. And uh, therefore, I think there should be a coordination between the data protection authorities when they uh, have cases of, uh, of a European-wide uh, dimension, like it would be with Facebook, Google, and, and other large companies, uh, so that uh, they, we, we can maintain a, a high level of, um, uh, of enforcement, even if the national uh, authority is a rather weak one, because the others will, put, uh, will uh, educate the, the, the weaker authority uh, to why they think it's important to, to act differently than, than they do. And I think these are the measures that we, that we need to uh, work with, but uh, still it, it will be an ongoing struggle, yes. Thank you. A comment at the back of the room? Hello. I'd like to ask about the negotiations about the free trade agreement between the USA and the EU. Supposedly, as, a, as it is written and discussed, it is concerned to a far extent uh, subjects such as transparency, data protection, uh, the access to, to knowledge, copyright, and all this kind of stuff that we are discussing during these days. The thing that I want to ask is, first of all, as we know, the negotiations are not transparent. We, what do we know about uh, what is this uh, treaty, the TTIP, is concerned uh, according to these matters? 
And the second thing, we can be optimistic. I mean, if, if what the TTIP watch is saying, uh, I suppose that the discussion that we do is how we can improve the framework that we already have. But uh, if the treaty contains the, the articles that it is said that it contains, then we go backwards. And uh, OK, that was the question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Who wants to respond to questions related to the free trade agreement, its lack of transparency, and um, the need for improving the current one? Thank you. Uh, well, I think with, with the TTIP agreement, uh, is uh, the, the European Union is doing the same mistake as with, as with ACTA. Uh, we have seen with ACTA that uh, the US side of the negotiations have been very good informed. Companies, uh, private sector, they had really good information because they uh, simply signed non-disclosure agreements and got access to the information and uh, could work with their government uh, to improve the, uh, the, the, the agreement in uh, supporting their, their interests, of course. While the European side of the negotiations uh, said, okay, no, this is secret, this is a, a closed document, nobody is allowed to see it, and even uh, uh, members of the European Parliament are not allowed to read the text, but and if they are, then only in a very secret room, and they are not allowed to take notes and, and don't know what. And now they are repeating the same mistake again. They uh, put themselves apart from, from those people who are able to advise them. To, to tell them which are the, the consequences of these things that are in these uh, proposals. And so a, very, a set of very few people is negotiating vis-a-vis uh, -vis a negotiation partner that has hundreds of people who are able to, to advise him. And this is one of the, of the fundamental uh, strategic mistakes, I think, uh, in, in such uh, negotiations. Uh, on the other hand, I think uh, that the, the advice of the European Parliament, uh, when they investigated the Snowden revelations, uh, should, uh, st should be followed. They said uh, the, the safe harbor agreement should be, uh, should be abandoned. They said that the uh, agreement on the transfer of passenger name record should be abandoned, and a number of, of other agreements uh, that give data to the, to the United States. And I think that also the negotiations uh, on TTIP uh, should be uh, put on, on uh, hold until there is uh, a movement from the US side regarding the, the mass surveillance of, surveillance of internet communication. Uh, but I think this is not a view that the European Commission will follow. Just a, a small remark uh, on the principle. There is a major problem in this kind of uh, international treaties that they risk to supersede national protective legislation, not just at the level of transparency. Just have in mind all these uh, international treaties within the World Trade Organization and the kind of economic international constitution that they're producing, which is sometimes very different than the national ones, especially at the level of the Europe. So, having in mind also that all these discussions are beyond the reach of the average citizen, then this brings about a major problem of democracy. Because these are rules that actually they are not discussed in any kind of public forum. They cannot be. Not only they are not transparent in the discussions, there is, any, there is not any kind of accountability of the people that are negotiating them. So one of the things we should have in mind is that uh, uh, we should ask for major, at least, treaties, not only to be ratified by national parliaments, but uh, also if they imply a qualitative shift from the protection at the domestic level, to be put also to referenda. We must find ways that uh, this transnational regulation that up till now is completely beyond any kind of democratic control to re-enter the democratic sphere of discussion and accountability.
Thank you very much. There was a question or comment to my left. Thank you. Uh, my name is Josef Baum, University of Vienna. I have a general proposal. It's only one point. Uh, it's not uh, definitely new. Uh, but uh, it, it is the pro proposal to make a good law on advertising uh, taxes. So we have some uh, ad taxes, but they were uh, limited almost to zero, many exceptions and so on. So I think uh, along the philosophy of the Tobin tax for financial transactions, I think uh, at least at the, uh, at the European level, there should be some ad uh, tax, and there is some consideration what to do with this tax. You can finance alternative media, for example, or so on. Uh, and this tax could be could have uh, some other positive implications, for example, to. Uh, to limit over uh, use of resources uh, and to regulate consumption and so on. So uh, I didn't see this. Um, this is only one point, I admit. So we, we should have a broad agenda. It's, it's one point of an agenda, and it's no, no revolutionary point, uh, and it's only for uh, some transformation because at the end, I think. We don't need this uh, advertisement for big companies. And one point would also be it could be designed in a way that it could help the, the small enterprises against the big enterprises because these advertisements are uh, at, uh, advantages for the big companies, for example. Thank you very much. So a proposal to have tax on advertisement? Uh, it's not only necessary to make a, a tax on advertisement generally. We can see, uh, for example, we, one of the suggestions would be just to know, uh, to make uh, laws that uh, uh, promote transparency. For example, Google Ads uh, can be more pure because uh, you don't know what you are advertising and the advertiser don't know exactly where it uh, advertised uh, the product. But um, we don't know how it's the rate that Google uh, keeps. We have no any indication about that. And only, uh, not that just that, it will, be, uh, uh, it will be a good thing if we have a law that every media uh, should uh, publish the, uh, the money that they take from every advertisement. Uh, or to have disclaimers uh, the, for the articles that mention uh, specific uh, advertising, uh, advertisements. And we have, it's not necessary to uh, go to Europe and uh, sudden, suddenly to convince all the big heads to make a law to, to solve early, uh, all the problems. We can start from uh, from low to high, to, to, to have some regulation laws uh, for that. Thank you very much. March 18 will be the f day of freedom of information. May 3rd will be the day of press freedom. Anybody want to make proposals on how we can raise awareness, use those days to advocate for freedom of information, for more protection for the freedom of press. Thank you. Is this on? Yes. Um, certainly with the um, May 3rd day, there's al already um, major events that go on around um, the world, really, um, to celebrate or to mark Press Freedom Day. And I wonder, in some senses, that if that event where journalists are present, as well as academics, NGOs, and other stakeholders, again, that mix of stakeholders, whether at that moment there is something like a public space created at the international level. And out of that, there are great opportunities 
um, to take those sorts of conversations further, not just to mark it as a day where you know there's an appalling roll call of um, journalists killed and intimidated, which of course you must mark and must recognise, but to think about that day in terms of what sort of um, um, actions we can take forward. And I mean, by we, I mean all sorts of people. I don't just mean um, journalists, I don't just mean NGOs. I'm thinking of myself as a journalism educator, um, but also citizens as well. And one of the things that we found when we were doing some of our interviewing amongst um, editors in the UK and uh, frontline journalists was that whilst they are aware, of course, um, that these violations against news media go ahead. They're also aware of the need for safety protections in conflict situations. There is a sense that they look after their own, in a way, in that what happens is that in the world's press, the death of a journalist or the intimidation of a journalist is marked very much by NGOs. We have the whole circulation of those kind of violations, but they don't find their, their way into the international media unless they're really high profile events. My argument would be that intimidation or a death of a journalist is actually of global concern to all media, whether they be in um, open democracies, countries where the media are free, there is a responsibility to report and mark this. Now the press are notoriously bad about reporting about themselves, I have to say, but I think it is one of those things that we could maybe say um, it is the possibility for civil society dialogue where we can all mark that as being not only attack on journalists but attack on our own freedom of information because where a story isn't reported, where a journalist is intimidated, where that story is never told, of course we are none the wiser and so as we as citizens are missing out. We don't even know what we're not hearing largely. We can only guess and so I think it's incumbent upon all of us um, as citizens, as members of civil society, to recognise that and to think about you know, what it costs many journalists in, in places where it is dangerous um, to do their job. Thank you. Thank you very much. Paracalo. My name is Kostas Salvanitis. I'm a director of the radio station 105 and 105 in the Kokino. Μια και ζητήσατε προτάσεις για το πώς θα εορταστεί η μέρα των δημοσιογράφων. Θα ήθελα να σας πω ότι είναι πολύ σωστό να ασχοληθούμε με τους συναδέλφους δημοσιογράφους που κυρδινεύουν στην Ασία, στην Αφρική, αυτές τις μέρες στην Ουκρανία, όμως θα πρότεινα αυτή τη φορά, επειδή το πρόβλημα είναι στο σπίτι μας, να αφιερώσουμε την ημέρα του τύπου για την Ελλάδα όπου στην Ελλάδα υπάρχει μίζον πρόβλημα ελευθεροτυπίας. Πολύ σοβαρό. Για αυτούς που δεν ήσασταν χθε εδώ, θέλω να σας πούμε ότι εδώ είναι συνάδελφοι οι οποίοι έχουν διωχθεί από την ιστορία. Να μπορούν να εκφράζονται, να μπορούν να γράφουν, να μπορούν να δηλώνουν ότι είναι δημοσιογράφοι. Και όπως πολύ σωστά δήλωσε ο καθηγητής ο κ. Κατρούγκαλος, αλλά και ο συναδελφός μου ο κ. Εφήμερος, θέλουμε να σας μεταφέρουμε ότι το ζήτημα που υπάρχει σήμερα στην Ελλάδα είναι πάρα πολύ σοβαρό καθώς τέσσερα μήντια μόνο των ίδιων ιδιοκτητών, οι οποίοι τροφοδοτούνται από τις τράπεζες, οι οποίες το χρήμα από την Κεντρική Ευρωπαϊκή Τράπεζα. Ό,τι διαφορετικό πνίγεται. Δεν θεωρείτε ότι για θέμα ευρωπαϊκής ομόνιας θα πρέπει αυτή τη φορά να τιμήσουμε την ιστορία και τη μάχη στην Ελλάδα. Δεν είναι δικό μας θέμα το τι γίνεται στην Ελλάδα. Σας ευχαριστώ. Thank you very much. I think, yes, there is broad agreement that what concerns Greece concerns all of us. In the larger frame, I would like to also reiterate your call that while it is obviously important and will always be important to use those international days for reflection, what is happening elsewhere, uh, there is a tendency um, to do just that and to not make the connection to human rights concerns uh, in one's own country. I would certainly venture to suggest that that applies to Austria, that we are very good at talking about 
the human rights in other places and not so good on reflecting on our own. Case in point is that the Austrian government actually has made freedom of the press a core issue of its campaign in the Human Rights Council of the United Nations. And we've heard, I think, amply on where it stands with regard to freedom of information. And the same can be, by the way, said for protecting the rights of minority. And minorities, again, something that Austria is highlighting by supporting the resolution on protecting minorities in the third committee of the General Assembly and then compare that to the plight of the 1955 State Treaty on Protecting Minorities. That just as a reinforcement, but again, solidarity with Greece and certainly first and foremost on March 18 and then May 3rd. Are there other comments or reflections at this point? Yes, please. Lia Diaz uh, from Spain. Uh, I would like to, I, I appreciate very much so all the proposals and in particular regarding so the building up of a, of a public sphere at the, the national level. And I would like to recall something that happened so in the 14th of November of 2012. So it's not long ago. And uh, at that time uh, in 24 countries there in Europe, there was demonstration so it was a general strike in Spain. There was a general strike in Portugal. There was also similar, it was not general in Greece, but in general, so 24 countries. And, uh, and I don't remember exactly the numbers now, but there was many, a number of millions of people demonstrating in the streets. And uh, <clears throat> it, this, this was actually uh, an historical event. So in, in, at the international level, that kind of strike. And uh, something that, that we were discussing in the previous days uh, concerning how the media was going to react, it was actually the case. So there was no European media that reflected properly, at least regarding so the European dimension, so the international dimension of the, of the affair. Only there was a small new in the, guard, in the Guardian and another very small notice in the in the Deutsche Zeitung, uh, but there was uh, important uh, news. So in American, South American, North American, that ASEAN uh, newspapers regarding so the importance of that. So that was uh, an important movement, and I'm recalling this because. Uh, so I was uh, also managing a project to, but to, to develop uh, so the e-democracy at the level of the universities, of the European universities, and uh, the level of participation we got to collect was, was not so significant. So if we compare, so the same level of participation that we had in the streets in the same year, so in, in Spain and other countries that were involved in the project, uh, so what I want to, 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 uh, to point is that, for example, for the organization of this big strike of the 14th of November, so the role of the unions, of the uh, trade unions, were very relevant as it was in, in Egypt in, in uh, that was 2011. And, uh, and, as, and as it has been, so the role of the, of the trade unions so for the most important strikes that ever happened in history this summer in, in Egypt. So the role of the, of the electronic or, or the information technologies is quite limited. And what I find is the need to connect somehow. Uh, so how to connect this infrastructure that is this real social network in the sense of, of sociality that is interconnected and, and and work so to mobilize and to make such a big strike. Uh, and, and I think we should somehow connect because I want just to point another element of the history of this 14th of November. The, the day afterward, this is something that we did not predict before. So the day after the 14th of November, uh, in which only local newspapers saw up the new saying that many people were uh, sewing up in the streets. Uh, the, at, at least in Spain, the bank, the bank owners 
uh, publish pa uh, articles, long articles. This was the only time, so in years, in which, in which the bankers really write articles saying there's only one line we have to follow. So, so uh, they are actually having the power. They don't, they don't need to show up. But in that day, I think this is quite significant. So that was a very important movement and the result. So it's not uh, so visible, but, but this, I think, is quite important. So that they need to show up. <laughs> so I just wanted to point out. Uh, I was the, I want to lower the level, say something in, in, in Greece it was exactly the opposite because when uh, the movement of Indignado started in, uh, in whole Europe, Greece, uh, can't, uh, he couldn't find uh, someone to inspire to the people to go out and, uh, and, and uh, claim anything. And then one night, uh, the mega channel, the mainstream media, saw a reportage of uh, what happened in Spain, and it was uh, um, a slogan, which, which is, the Greeks are sleeping, and the next day, all the uh, all Greeks were at the Sidagma Square, so they did it uh, wrong, they didn't expect this. But uh, you see, it's, something is changing, because all this Greek, um, all this big media can, it tries to hide under the carpet what is really happening in whole, whole Europe. But we have the rise of new independent media through Europe. We, we started exactly at the, the beginning of the crisis, at 2010. And we had uh, 2,000 uh, visitors uh, the first month. And this month we closed with 1.4 million absolute unique visitors. because. Uh, the thing is that smaller media uh, finds way to communicate with other small media through Europe and we create a network and I think this public space that Mr. Katrugalo says is building up from below, from the bottom up. Yeah, just, I, I, just, just a few words in addition, I think it's really important and really interesting to, to mention the international collaborations and so on and you mentioned also earlier the focus on the national, we should go international and all that. But I think there are really interesting traces at least in what we're talking about here, or more than that probably in terms of international collaboration. Of course we have ADRI as a really important European network and hugely uh, important and influential, but also other bilateral connections, even with local uh, initiatives, some of those that I mentioned, like the, or that were mentioned before, the Austrian uh, Transparency Law Initiative has, to my knowledge, at least had connections or has connections also with the one in Hamburg. The one in Hamburg is advising other similar initiatives in other parts of Germany and other lender or local initiatives and so on. So these these connections are happening. The same with uh, the example of Latin America that I mentioned. People in um, in Argentina that were involved have been involved in this uh, in, in media policy reform there. I've been collaborating with people in Uruguay and they've learned from each other in terms of strategies, in terms of their agendas, uh, also pushing the, the laws and, and lawmaking forward. Their uh, experiences have been taken up by people elsewhere in Chile and now in Mexico and so on where they're a little bit uh, behind in, 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 in some aspects of, of the, the legal development, for example, the legalization of community broadcasting and so on. So some of these connections everywhere are really there also in, on, on a kind of more ground level, maybe not in terms of a huge movement, but I think they are happening and I think that's, uh, that's promising. Thank you very much. There is a policy and advocacy tool that I have been waiting for and it hasn't come up. So I'll just throw it in. And that is the reporting mechanism to the Human Rights Committee under the Covenant for Civil and Political Rights. And I'm getting a furious nod here from George. Uh, and particularly so because Austria is up for review under the CCPR in March of 2015 and civil society reports will be received gladly by the committee until the end of this year. Interestingly though, um, the United States of America are up for review and up for state dialogue under the CCPR uh, in 10 days, that is March 13 and 14, I understand um, that the state dialogue is happening there. So that's an, a, a tool to connect between the national and the international level and create um, some change by uh, 
forcing the government to accept some recommendations. The same goes for the Universal Periodic Review. There were two um, issues that came up earlier in the day that I thought I was hoping um, that they would come up in some of the comments in a more pronounced way. One was education, the role of education more generally uh, on protecting information, freedom of information, sorry, and making people more aware of what their rights are. And the other one was participation because we have another very funny example quote unquote funny, uh, in Austria on, uh, on that issue in that the federal government has actually agreed to standards of participation. They're published under participation.at, that's the German word for participation. And those standards are set to ensure that government and administration do engage with civil society or non-governmental actors in a certain way. And the fascinating thing is that nobody knows of them. So here you have an EU um, directive that has been uh, transposed and has been adopted by a government and nobody knows about it. And um, again, that is obviously uh, something related to awareness raising. But I don't mean to monopolize the mic. Are there any comments left? If not, then I would like to take this opportunity to take the thank the panelists for their contributions, for your comments and additions, and I would like to entice you to use your freedom of speech to talk about the importance of freedom of information and the freedom of the press, but obviously all human rights for all. Thank you so very much.